Hi, thank you. My name's Dan. When I walked in the building, the first thing I saw were those doors, and I said, wouldn't it be awesome if I walked out with a fog machine behind me? And they made it happen right away. Um, <laughs> so yeah, my name's Dan. Uh, like they said, I write uh, for the Huffington Post. I've had some stuff in Salon and Alternet. And uh, I work with the Richard Dawkins Foundation and American Atheists. And uh, yeah, and I have a book coming out on uh, secular parenting. Uh, not sure when it's going to be out yet, but as soon as it is, I'll let you know, and I'm sure Debbie can get that in the newsletter for me. Um, but yeah, so I'm here today to introduce C.J. Werleman. Uh, I wrote some notes down. My memory's not good. I'm getting old. Uh. <laughs> so uh, C.J., if you don't know him, uh, he brings a very unique voice to the secular movement, a mixture of wit, intelligence, uh, stunning good looks. And <laughs> if you haven't seen him, ladies. Uh, CJ, has, CJ has quite a gift. Uh, if you follow him on Twitter, at CJ Werleman, what you'll find is someone that will make you laugh and then get angry all at the same time. Uh, he's, his, his wit and uh, intelligence mixed together is just often unmatched in the community, and I think it's needed to kind of lighten the mood, but also get us inspired to get out and do something. Uh, in his book, Crucifying America, The Holy Alliance Between the Christian Right and Wall Street, he uses that same brand of, of humor and intelligence to tell atheists to get up and stop fighting about the word God on a dollar bill. Because while we're doing that, the Christian right is passing uh, restrictive abortion laws. And they're taking away our rights while we're arguing over a lot of smaller and petty things. and. It's, it's a call to action. It's to tell you to get up and, and do something. Uh, if you follow him on Alternate and Salon, where he is a uh, contributing columnist over there, uh, he reaches a much broader audience. He is, and he's going after and telling everybody uh, about what the Tea Party is up to. And uh, my personal favorite, he loves to take down libertarians. Uh, uh, he makes a strong case for if evidence matters to you, you cannot be a Republican. Uh, it's <laughs> and, he, and, and he's right. Uh, he, also, he also put out some lessons of what we can learn from someone like Pope Francis. We all love to tear him apart, but there's things while we're doing that that we maybe should take from him and put into our own lives. And I think that was uh, a really great article. And if you haven't read it, look it up. Uh, so, and CJ's other books, he has completely deconstructed uh, the Old Testament and God hates you, hate him back. Uh, he did the same for the New Testament and Jesus lied, he's only human. And uh, he was brave enough to take on the Quran in his book, Quran Curious. Uh, all of which are, are amazing, hilarious, and uh, insightful. I think I learned more about the Bible in those books than I did from actually reading the Bible myself. But in all of CJ's books and articles, you'll find an unapologetic activist who deeply cares about the direction the world and this country is headed. And he is a tireless fighter for the separation of church and state. Uh, CJ himself is more of a mentor to me than I think he even knows, and probably more of a mentor to me than he agreed to be when he first answered my email. <laughs> uh, he's, he's by far one of the most kind, funny, and generous individuals I've ever met and had the pleasure of knowing. And it's a great honor to stand here today and welcome up to the stage my friend and the number one sexiest man in all of Australia, CJ Werleman. When I get home, I'm actually going to replay Dan's introduction to me over and over and <laughs> over again. <laughs> Is this microphone working? Oh, here we go. Uh, Dan's just given me an awesome in introduction, and, and uh, if you don't know Dan, he's one of the fastest emerging writers of progressive politics and also secularism here in the US. Uh, his articles tend to go viral in cyberspace. He's probably the smartest American in this country with a neck tattoo. <laughs> so I generally want to thank you for the introduction, Dan. It was very, uh, very kind words and, and certainly much appreciated. 
So I was reading, so San Diego, hello, I don't, you guys San Diegoans, San, San Di Diego Gins? Diego. Diego? Okay. I, I was, I heard somewhere this place was discovered by the Germans in 1854. Or, it is, <laughs> on a big ship. Or am I thinking of Anchorman? Anyway, so uh, thank you to the San Diego fellow, Philip, what is, you guys call yourselves? Humanist fellowships. I got to love the word humanist. I think that's a fantastic term. Uh, I like it more than the the label atheist. Um, atheism to me is such a small part of who I am. I'm not a, a rabid atheist by any stretch. I've never believed in God or a deity my whole life. So it's you know it's like breathing. Not believing in a God is like breathing for me. I understand a lot of Americans have had a traumatic journey in transitioning from belief into non-belief. And it has meant the ostracization in, in certainly community, like in some communities. Interesting, when I spoke in, in, um, in Boston uh, last year, uh, a woman approached me and, uh, and she said, none of my family even know that I'm here. My family would be horrified if they knew I was an atheist. Now, that blew me away because in Australia, it's almost the other way. You tell someone you're a, uh, a fundamentalist Christian and, you know, you're, you're put on the short bus. <laughs> but um, if, any, if you follow my work or my writing on Salon or Alternate, or if you've read my most recent book, Crucifying America, you'll know that every essence of, of my professional being is spent fighting the, the real and present threat of the Christian right and not only them, but also the, uh, the corporate takeover of the United States of America. Um, but first, I kind of want to back up a little bit and, and sort of share with you what got me into writing about religion in the first place and what motivated me to write my first book, which was God Hates You, Hate Him Back. Um, in 2002, my wife and I and our, our two small, chids, uh, two small children, uh, children at that time, we migrated from Sydney, Australia to uh, Bali, Indonesia where we live for just over a decade. And uh, Bali is about the most idyllic place in the world that you can live in as an, as an expatriate. You know, life is very, very comfortable uh, down there. People are wonderful. And ordinarily, it's been a very safe place to live. But on October the 2nd, 2005, uh, something that I witnessed is what propelled me into action to write about religion and religious uh, fanaticism. Um, on that night, uh, we were having dinner at uh, very good friends of ours, with a half a dozen other friends. Um, it was the most idyllic day you could ever imagine. Just one of those days, those all too rare diamond days we get to experience in our life. Those days that are just so perfect. The day was half a dozen of our friends attending a, a you know a mate's barbecue. He lives in this amazing compounded garden, you know, compounded grounds with manicured lawns you know, swimming pools. We've been drinking beer in the pool all day. The kids are running wild, kicking the footy around in the backyard. Um, it got to about seven o'clock that night. We we're just about to sit down to dinner, to a seafood dinner. Now, this is in Jimbaran Beach. Now has, now, has anybody been to Bali, Indonesia? No? Yeah, you should, you should. It's not all eat, pray, love. It's more drink, swear, and <laughs> drink, swear, and surf. But. But, uh, I mean, it's a great place. So anyway, 7 o'clock at night, we're about to sit down to dinner. Barbecue's ready. We're all buzzing. We're now pretty drunk, but we're, we're having a great day. And just as dinner is about to start, and we're all sitting there, this most amazing God-wrenching blast that you've ever heard in your life. And was just coming from outside the wall of the compound of my friend's home. Uh, a few of my friends who actually had been in Bali at the time of the 2002 bombing, which was an, an Al-Qaeda-inspired attack, uh, which killed 220 Westerners, including, I think, a half a dozen Americans. Um, now, one or two of them said, oh my God, that sounded like the bomb, you know, from the several years earlier. So, and a couple of others tried to rationalize again, maybe it was a, you know, a, uh, a gas cylinder that blew up, maybe it was an electrical, you know, grid. Uh, that blew up, but a few of us started to investigate and we sort of got up from the dinner table from where we were sitting, which was outside, and we moved to the 
the extremity of the property against the compound wall. And we're all trying to like prick our ears up to try and figure if we can hear, is there any screaming, is there any commotion outside that wall? And we couldn't hear anything. And then bam, second blast. And the shock wave from that blast literally sucked the air uh, out of your lungs. And at that stage, we were under no delusion. It was a, a bomb and it had been two bombs. But we didn't know if it was a suicide bomb or if it had been a car bomb um, or, or whatever else. Next door to his property is the Marriott Hotel. So Jamari's Lamaya, which is a franchise of Al-Qaeda, have a long history of bombing American targets, particularly Western hotels. Earlier, they had bombed the, the Marriott in Jakarta, which killed about a dozen people and almost destroyed that, almost leveled that hotel. So we, half a dozen of us, we grab whatever we could find, towels, water, you know, and we just ran towards the beach, you know, which was around about 100 metres away. Now, Jim Brown Beach is, you know, that's, you know, it's where tourists go to eat freshly cooked seafood on the sand. You're literally this far to the wall away from the crashing waves and eating some of the best seafood you could ever have. And it's predominantly tourist families sitting down there. We run down there, and as we get closer to the, the blast centre, we're getting close to people who are running in the opposite direction. We're now, now bleeding, now wounds, now screaming and hysteria. Uh, we get down to the, the blast site, and it's just unimaginable carnage. Um, you're talking families, you know, husband and wives with their kids. Kids blown apart, severed limbs, the smell of burning, rotting flesh, people screaming, screaming, mass confusion. And also, this I've never experienced primal fear like that because you didn't know if there was more suicide bombers. We didn't know if that there was going to be, you know, how big this wave of attack was at the time. We also were worried that the typical Al Qaeda strategy is to bomb in one spot. And then where people are going to flee to the exit point, they usually park a car bomb in that spot. So the people fleeing run straight into the secondary blast. So at that time, we're thinking, holy shit, what? You know, this, but we're trying to do our best to get the wounded and, and sort the wounded from the dead on the sand. So we picked up this, you know, one lady I'll never forget who was an Australian and her husband. Her husband had been totally blinded in, in, in the blast. And as we picked her up, uh, she was still moaning and groaning. We, we picked her up onto a makeshift table and just as we picked her up and I, I had a hold of her, what would have been her left leg, her left leg came off at the kneecap. Now she died pretty much there, you know, spot she had her last breath there. Now, as ugly and as and the carnage as that is, and it really is, that's reality. And reality is ugly. And it's the world we live in today. I mean, if, uh, if human history has taught us anything, is that the human species uh, is willing to uh, inflict the worst ugliness on, on other people. And that's what that was. Now, that led me to writing my first book. But then when I, you know, I really became involved then in US politics from that point, was sort of transition, you had the war on terror and so forth. As horrific as that is, and as horrific it is when a Palestinian walks onto a bus and blows himself up and, you know, and, and, and with him, you know, a dozen innocent school children on the way to school, or a Jewish settler in the occupied territories walks into a mosque and pulls out an AK-47 from under his robe and annihilates everyone in that mosque. These things, as Westerners, and particularly as Americans, we are horrified by it. We're shocked by it. We, we never are not shocked by it. But what we're not shocked by is the fact that this year, 20,000 Americans will die in this country because a for-profit corporation, an insurance company, will deny adequate medical care to a, a sick American because it's unprofitable to do that. Now, how did we get to this? We're talking about six dead American Westerners on a beach. We're now talking about 20,000 dead Americans who are effectively going to be murdered by at the corporate totalitarian state. And the reason that we're here in America now in such a thing, and, and the reason I'm fighting so hard well, with so many other people, is the fact that the corporate totalitarian state 
is so intrusive and pervasive in this country. In his book, um, Sheldon Wallen, who is a, um, a Harvard professor, he wrote a book called Democracy Incorporated. And what he spoke about is in classical totalitarian states, you know, uh, politics trumps economics. In, in inverted totalitarian states and in corporate totalitarian states, which is what the United States is, it's economics trumps, trumps politics. Now, Reaganomics or trickle-down economics or even voodoo economics is what, you know, the Republican president, George H. Bush, uh, probably the only smart one in that family, <laughs> He, uh, he said that, he called that voodoo economics. That is the economic apparatus of the corporate totalitarian state. In the last three decades, we have seen the greatest wealth, transfer of wealth from the middle class to the rich in American history. This has come courtesy of a rigged tax code, which now sees the richest and the corporations contribute the lowest percentage of total tax revenues to the federal government ever. So what have you received in return? Well, despite being the richest nation on the planet, you have become a broken third world banana republic. For most of the 21st century, America was the envy of the world. I'm obsessed with America. I've always been obsessed with America. My friends in high school used to just hang so much shit on me for being a wannabe American. <laughs> you know, JFK was my dad's idol, and I guess through him, he became my idol as well, even though I was born 10 years after he was assassinated. But, and I'm sure people who are watching this YouTube you know, replay are just gonna pass me off as another anti-American foreigner, uh, which is certainly incorrect. I love America, and who, who loves America more than an immigrant who moves here and wants to help try and make things better. And that's what I'd like to consider myself. But today, not a single US city ranks in the top 20 most livable cities in the world. Not one US airport ranks in the top 100 airports in the world. Our public schools, our bridges and roads are falling apart. Our, high, our rail, of which none is high speed, is literally falling off the tracks. Have you guys been to Asia, which what we think of as third world countries? Their airports look like space stations. Their rail networks run at 300 miles an hour. <laughs> this is unheard of here. Um, while 46 million Americans live in abject poverty. Worse, our sense of food insecurity in this country is now on par with countries like Tanzania and Indonesia, rather than being on par with countries like Canada and Australia. Last week, the annual Social Progress Index was released. Now, this index is a new, index is a new way of looking at the success of countries. Um, it examines how successfully countries are meeting the needs of their people. Rather than measuring a country's success by a per capita GDP, the index is based on a, an array of data reflecting everything from suicide, ecosystem sustainability, property rights, access to health care and education, gender equality, attitudes towards Im Im immigrants and minorities, nutrition, infrastructure and so forth. Well, the index, you know, measures the li effectively the livability of each country. Now, people everywhere depend on the same things. We all want clean water. We all want safe food to eat. We all want uh, to have access to education to improve our lives. We all want to feel safe. Uh, where we live, but whilst the US is the richest country on the nation with the second highest GDP per capita in the world, the US ranks at a very underperforming 16th overall. It gets worse. Ranks 70 in health, 69 in ecosystem sustainability, 40 in basic education, 34 in access to water and sanitation, and 31 in personal safety. The highest ranked countries include Australia, Norway, Finland, Switzerland, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Canada. In first place is New Zealand, which has a per capita GDP of half the United States. Which means New Zealand is, you know, using its economic growth to meet the needs of its people. 
Now, not coincidentally, these countries also are ranked in the top 10 of the UN World Happiness Index. So these countries are also the happiest countries in the world. What about the US? We're 17th behind Mexico. Not long before they build a wall to stop you going down there. <laughs> now, the, 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 excuse me, the verdict is out. You know, the jury has come to a, a verdict and we need to stop pretending otherwise. The happiest countries and the, those countries with the greatest social progress are those countries that have, you know, where the size, of, the size of the state is bigger and where tax revenue on the rich and corporations is greater. You know, the complete opposite of everything the Republican Party and corporate America would like to tell you. Today, corporations sit on record trillion dollar profits. Never in America's history have corporations been so profitable and so rich. Uh, while wages for the middle class have stagnated and benefits have receded, and we have a minimum wage in this country which is equal to 1969 levels. How is that shared prosperity? Now, the only thing being shared is prison incarceration. You know, the US represents less than 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the incarcerated population. Now, the reason this is happening is because we've privatised prisons. A poor person in this country is of no value to a corporation. They have no money. Now, corporations aren't interested in the common good. But put a poor person in jail for dra draconian drug laws, all of a sudden, corporations make $50,000 a year from that poor person being in jail. How does that benefit our communities? How does it benefit taking the breadwinner in that family who happens to have pot on him? I had pot on me half an hour earlier. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, 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 but I'm white and I'm semi-rich, so I don't go to jail. <laughs> you know, this is how America works. Now, um, we have to look, how does this all benefit society? The Walmart heirs own more than their combined net worth of the bottom 40% of Americans. Heirs, they did not build that. They did not create that. They were just fortunate enough to inherit wealth. But we have re re aggressively repealed the most progressive tax law in this country, which is the estate tax. So now these wealthy families just to keep getting the pass down these, you know, uh, these birthrights the, or the genetic lottery of birthrights to their heirs. And again, that's not passed on to roads, infrastructure, schools, investment for the future, paying off the national debt, you name it. And it gets worse. Despite obscene profits and record billion, you know, profits and despite this obscene level of wealth, Walmart pays its workers so little, they pay them poverty level, level wages, that the federal government is forced to subsidise their workers through food stamps and welfare and the like. That kind of corporate welfare in this country costs the average taxpayer $1,300 per year. You, every single person in here, is subsidising the wealthiest corporation in America with your fucking tax dollars. I. Why isn't anyone outraged by this? It's reverse Robin Hoodism and it's happening here. Now, one of the things that corporate America and the Republican Party have done, and, and Democrats aren't blameless either, a lot of the Democrat Party are taken over by corporate interests, and I'm, I'm looking at you, Hillary. But they've done an amazing job at demoralising, confusing and suppressing the average American voter. And that's the influence money buys in politics. Corporations are not concerned with the common good. They exploit, pollute, impoverish, repress, kill, all in the effort of making money. They throw poor families out of homes, let the uninsured die, wage needless wars to make profits. They poison, they pollute the ecosystem, they slash social assistance programs, gut public education, trash the global economy, and crush popular movements that seek justice for working men and women. So where are we headed? Chris Hedges, who's a New York, well, a former New York Times uh, columnist, war correspondent, and a, and a Pulitzer Prize winner, gave a really good snapshot of where this country is heading. And I quote, 
Our anemic democracy will soon be replaced by a robust police state. The elite, the elite will withdraw into heavily gate-guarded communities where they will have access to security goods and services that cannot be afforded by the rest of us. Tens of millions of people, brutally controlled, will live in perpetual poverty. The rich will live like in Johannesburg. If you've been to Johannesburg in South Africa, the rich live behind compound walls with usually carrying guards at the front, whereas the poor and middle class live in a state which is an aggressive police state with rampant crime, no social programs, and no economic future. Unfortunately, we can't rely on the Democratic Party to win these, this existential fight uh, for us. Many with the, within the DNC are as beholden to corporate America as their Republican counterparts. But the, G, the GOP stands alone in the, as the sole guardian for protecting the rich at the expense of everyone else. Last week alone, on a single day, the Senate Republicans blocked a raise in the minimum wage, they blocked the equal pay bill, they blocked a LGBT bill, and, uh, and also a bill to uh, ensure mine safety for their workers. Now that is a party 100% serving only the 1% in this country. But America is in dire need of a revolution. It needs rebels to fight the corporate system. America needs a radical populist economics movement to offer a countervailing power to corporate America. Otherwise, America will only be the envy of countries like Mexico and Bangladesh. So it's up to you, and thank you very much.